Hey everybody, this is Aubrey Chavez from Faith Matters. In this second episode about political tribalism and its effects on Latter-day Saint congregations, we invited Mesa, Arizona Councilwoman Julie Spilsbury and her husband Jeremy Spilsbury to talk specifically about their own challenging experiences in their local ward and community. Jeremy was serving as their ward's bishop until his term expired a few weeks ago. Their story is fascinating and illustrates both the challenges and the opportunities that we face in creating Zion. In this conversation, the Spilsburys share their very personal spiritual experiences that led them to engage in the political sphere from a strong sense of compassion. Not surprisingly, given the political environment in our country, and particularly in Arizona, that decision was not universally appreciated. But love can be an irresistible force over time and healing the inevitable result. We hope you enjoy this episode. Hello, everyone. This is Bill Turnbull with Faith Matters, and I am here with uh, Julie and Jeremy Spilsbury. Julie, we had on our podcast, actually it was just yesterday, Julie, that recorded that with, uh, with Mayor Giles. And so you are a councilwoman uh, in Mesa, Arizona. And uh, Jeremy um, was just, just recently released as Bishop of the Ward there. And they have an interesting, I think, story to, to tell. So um, hello, welcome. Hi. Hi. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to be here. Yes. Um, tell us, um, I, I'd like to, I think the listeners might like to know a little bit about your story. Um, Julie, you're pretty new to politics. Uh, Jeremy got involved in, um, in, in just a, as a private citizen, and Julie was an elected official um, in you know, this last political round, and it's had some interesting consequences. So maybe just maybe just turn it over to you and just tell us what ran up to this. What is it that, first of all, inspired you to become political act, politically active and um, what that experience has been? And we'll, yeah. Okay, so um, it, I, I do have to go back 24 years to when we first got married. And I realized really quick that one of his absolute passions was politics and I did not grow up like that. And so I was like, oh shoot, I don't know anything about politics. <laughs> but if I wanted to have those conversations with my husband who felt really strongly and passionately about politics. So I started listening to talk radio and getting um, kind of obsessed with talk radio for a while. This oh. was 24 years ago, right? So. Um, Anyways, but never zero political aspirations. He always joked that someday maybe he would run for office. And um, anyway, so we've been, you know, fairly, we were precinct committee men at one point. We've helped on some elections, um, you know, following things, but no aspirations. So I have, we have six children, um, five girls and one boy, ages 14 to 23. So we've been busy raising kids. And so, and uh, running a business. And so I spent the last 17 years in the schools um, helping with school stuff, right? Volunteering and running the books for our business. And so um, I was really passionate about education and was considering running for the school board. And um, I got contacted by the mayor a few times to, well, to meet through an, through a, an, yeah, through someone who knew both of us. That just kept saying hey the mayor wants to meet with you and i'm like i don't want to meet with the mayor <laughs> so then i was talking to a friend that said well if you're going to run for school board go meet the mayor he can find out who you are and um maybe endorse you when you run for school board and, and it was just all kind of up in the air at that point so two years ago it, it was two years ago april i went and met with the mayor and sat in his office and he talked to me about the influence i could have on city council for the same population right all these kids and families that I cared about in Mesa were still the same families and kids that, that I would be affecting on city council, but with more resources and a bigger umbrella. And um, I still wasn't really interested. And then my heart started racing and I had just a, kind of an incredible um, experience recognizing that God wanted me to do this and I did not want to do it. I came home and I said, Jeremy, I think I'm supposed to run for city council. And he's like, no, that's not why you went to go meet with the mayor. So after lots of prayer and struggling um, and talking to people, we made the decision to run. And that led to a year and a half of running a campaign, right? For the first time. And who am I? I'm just a mom <laughs> with a lot of opinions. So 
Um, it was an incredible experience, but a very, very hard experience. And I spent a lot of time on my knees, um, just kind of begging Heavenly Father to not make me do this because <laughs> I didn't want to do it because it was stretching me in ways that were really hard. So um, back when the pandemic hit, I was still in the middle of my campaign. My election was August and that was hard trying to, you know, you, that, that immediately cut off all the ability to go meet with people, knock on doors, get signatures, you know, luckily I had gotten all my signatures for my, um, to be able to run before that. But so we had a lot of time on our hands and we started listening um, even before this, but at, maybe at a more accelerated rate, we started listening to lots of podcasts, reading books, having really intense conversations with our college age daughters who are both return missionaries and are deep thinkers and love to dig deep into topics. And we just had kind of, um, and this was in the middle of, of the whole political season, right? There was a presidential election that fall as well. My election was in the primaries in August, luckily. So I could get that done with before <laughs> November, but so, we um lots and we faith matters was one of our favorite podcasts we were listening to it like crazy mm. lots of um richard osler's listen learn love um what were some of the other ones i don't know and reading every book we could find and telling each other read this or here's this quote or listen to this podcast so it's kind of a fun um period of discovery and a journey of of where we had been so i'll let him continue with that in a minute but so I was elected. I ran against an incumbent who was causing some problems on city council. And if I'm anything, I'm nice. Um, I, I try to be a nice person. I get along with people. And that was kind of an issue that the person before me was having, was not getting along with people. So I won 55, 45. Um, then I had to actually do the job. I started a hashtag Mesa kindness campaign. Like I was just gonna go in there and it's nonpartisan which I loved because I didn't want to run in a partisan position. And so um, I thought I could just get in there and just be nice and everyone would like me and I could help fight for people who didn't have a voice. I, I felt really strongly that one of the reasons God wanted me in there was um, to be a voice for people who don't have a voice. You know, whether that's, you know, immigrants, LGBTQ population, the Hispanics, the, you know, whatever, the homeless population, there's a lot of populations in our community that don't have a voice. Mason been, is- um, had, had, this been, had this been a real concern of yours before? I mean, in the decades before, had, had this been on your radar, these sort of marginalized populations or how, how did you come to, uh, have that as a primary objective of your political life then? Yeah, I just more and more, I just started seeing all of these different groups of people who were incredible and who just didn't have a voice because they weren't the <laughs> people who were um, necessarily in front of everyone and making decisions, whatever. Um, my, our schools that my kids have attended, so I was going to say Mesa has a population of 520,000. It's like the 32nd largest city in the nation. It's a, quite a large city. So there's a very big spectrum of issues, right? So there's a lot of, that's going on and there's a billion different issues you can get behind. But I very quickly wanted to make sure, um, so, so the schools that my kids have attended, the three schools, the elementary, junior high, and high school, typically are 60 to 70% Hispanic. Um, and I love the diversity, but I also noticed that a lot of those people didn't have a voice um, because they, there was a language barrier, they were working, they were trying to provide for their kids. There's a cultural difference that causes a lot of problems with when people meet and how, just how things were done. And so I was always working, trying to figure out how we could reach out to those families because I knew that they loved their kids just as much as I loved my kids, but they didn't have the you know ability or the access to be able to volunteer you know as much as I did or whatever. Yeah. So they just tended to not have that voice. Um, and then as this year was also progressing and I've opened my heart and my mind to the LGBTQ issue, I really started recognizing that they needed a voice too, and that we needed to 
we needed to treat everyone a lot better and bring everyone in. And so I felt like on city council, that was some something that I could do. Um, so I started in January, so it hasn't been that long. <laughs> I've done it for five months so far, and it's it's been an interesting experience. Yeah, we so talked yesterday. We're, we're just laughing that I'm the I'm the politician now, even though I'm not a politician. <laughs> He's supporting me, so. <laughs> Yeah, and full disclosure here, we know each other somewhat because we're related by marriage, but yes. we haven't, I don't remember, I don't think we've ever, we don't see each other very often at no. the occasional, the occasional family gathering, yes. uh, and I don't know if we've ever talked about anything related to politics or religion as far as I no. remember. No. Um, I had a vague notion that you were pretty, um, you know, conservative and traditional, um, both religiously and politically and yes. obviously very thoughtful, um, bright people, but we'd never had much of a chance to talk. So I didn't know what was going on in your lives during the last, uh, when you say um, you were, uh, you, 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 you listen to a lot of talk radio, what, what flavor of talk radio is that, might I ask? And what, it, you know, <laughs> it's all talk radio that I would never listen to anymore. So Back in the day, it was Rush Limbaugh, and then we have we have like Dennis Prager, um, some local people yeah. that I like to listen to. More so it's kind of very conservative. Well, very conservative. What, yeah, sort of right wing radio. Huh? Uh huh. And we, we always have been. We were both uh, registered Republicans, and um, okay. Yeah. Okay. So. But but I, I mean Sean Hannity. Um, who's the LDS guy that I just forgot his name? Oh, Glenn, Glenn Beck. Beck. Right. Yeah, yeah. All those people back in the day <laughs> were laughing now, but <laughs> it, it all got a little too much for me. Um, after Trump got elected the first time, I sort of was just turned off of everything and I just kind of stopped listening. We, I just turned to podcasts at that point, right? Podcasts kind of started becoming more of a thing and um, mm -hmm. I would rather listen to stuff that was filling my mind with good thoughts and good feelings and good ideas and ways to help me be a better person than listening to the rhetoric that I was hearing on the radio. So yeah. at least five years ago, we kind of stopped listening. <laughs> right. Yeah. So, so Jeremy, what's, um, let's get your take on this. Yeah. So for the, for the record, I was shocked when she came home and, and said she felt compelled to do this, but I, I was very quickly, um, very um, enthusiastic about it because of just her ability to connect with people. And, uh, and she's not, um, she's very authentic and she's exactly what I thought Mesa needed um, to bring people together. I thought she would have a unique perspective and ability to do that because um, that's, her, that's her main goal. She's not, not looking to be a politician or, or to you know, to go further. Let me insert something really quick what, what, that I think is important. I started watching all the council meetings and I started to enjoy watching the council meetings, which is weird because the, often they're quite boring, but I was really interested in it. But what I noticed, there was one woman on the council with seven people. So we have a six council and a mayor. Um, so there was one woman and she's not a mother and she's not conservative. And so I was like, wow, my voice is not represented on that council. And so that was one of the things that really helped me to decide to run is because I recognized that me and all of the people who I know and rub shoulders with every day were not represented. And so that was an easy way for me to realize, oh, my voice is absolutely needed on that council. So anyway. Yeah, and, and this is occurring during this very uh, negatively polarized time of, the, of, you know, of politics. And I, and I thought you can go in and make a difference in our, in our community. You can, you can be a voice of, of positivity, of, of unity. And I, I, don't, I couldn't think of a better person. So I got, I got very excited about it, um, her, you know, her um, running for, for city council. Um, you gonna say something? No, go okay. ahead. Yeah. It's your turn. <laughs> I, I just, I, you know, I feel like um, we're kind of in a an Alma 26, 25, 26 moment where that's where where um, Ammon is, you know, he's he's just uh, glorying in the success that they had, and he's he's uh, talking to his brother and remembering, you know, the 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 reaction that the Nephites had originally when they were going to go do this. And, and they were just saying, you guys are crazy. You know, you, you're not gonna have success. These are, 
he's, he's you know, they're bloodthirsty. You're not going to be able to, um, to, to bring them to a knowledge of the truth. And then in verse 25, you know, I've, I've read this many times, but it became chilling as I kind of thought about um, more about this story. They said, and more what they said unto us, let us take up arms against them and, and destroy them, that we may destroy them and their iniquity out of the land before they, uh, you know, basically do the same thing to us. And I, I just thought, this is unbelievable. The, the Nephites wanted to go destroy these people. And, and here resided among these Lamanites, some of the most noble spirits, you know, that had, that we'd ever seen. But they felt justified because they knew the Lamanites wanted to kill them. So, so just <laughs> this ability to get into a, to, to have a mindset where you feel justified in, in doing something so extreme. And here this whole time, you know, we learned that God had had this great harvest ready to, to, to be, um, to be harvested. This, the field was white and ready yeah. to harvest. So how does, how do you connect that with what was going on in your community? What's the, Connect the dots for us here. Yeah, and so I, I just there, there there was this negative polarization where we we did we no longer are gathering around principles that unify us. We're gathering around um, you know we we find commonality in, in enemies like you know we're, we're we're a group because we hate this other group and 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 it just became an echo chamber and just reinforced. Um, all the, the, you know, the negative uh, stereotypes of these other groups. And it just became very easy and, and people became, you know, I, I got the sense that they felt very justified in viewing these people in, in the most, you know, uncharitable ways. Evil. <laughs> they called them evil. <laughs> yeah. And, and so there, there's this, there wasn't the space for being able to have good faith um, discussions and conversations about you know, differing uh, opinions it was just, it was just disappearing and it was just yeah. immediate, you know, war. Yeah. I, I, I have a... the, my favorite part of the Ammon uh, analogy is that all the Nephites were telling him, you can't go there. We have to kill them. You, you're crazy. And Ammon says, and he can quote scripture better than I can, but he calls them his brethren right? Like he doesn't call him the enemy. He calls them his brethren. He was able to see them as his brothers and sisters slash children of God, right? Yeah. So then that's, that's what changed. And not only did he have in the sons of all those sons of Mosaic have incredible success, but the Lamanites eventually became more righteous than the Nephites, right? I mean, it's an incredible story that if if they hadn't seen them as their brethren and shown incredible love and service and saw them as God saw them instead of what the Nephites saw them as, that never would have happened. We wouldn't have thought all of those. So that stands as a challenge to us. That's, that's something that we need to do actively as Latter-day Saints. Um, and, and yet we seem to um, too readily buy into narratives that really make the other side evil now i'm i'm more familiar i guess i'm familiar with narratives on both sides yeah. um, probably on your because that that happens on on both sides and you're right like this it's like the easiest way you unite people is by uh, establishing a common a common enemy and right? social media is perfect for that <laughs> oh absolutely that's that's what it does yeah it, that's what it does perfectly um i i'm all i'm aware because i've i have really good friends that i respect a great deal, but they have stories that um, about their political people they politically oppose, and it's not enough to disagree with them, and not enough to even deeply disagree with them. Um, there, at the end, you, there's this narrative, this underlying narrative that they're actually evil, and some of these stories of how evil they are become quite involved. You know, like they become these. Uh, conspiracy theories. We've sort of addressed that on in previous um, episodes here, but uh, we get rather elaborate conspiracy theories that develop around. And, it, you know, it's, I'm just, I'm just struck that this, these chapters of scripture that you cited and, and like President Oaks's recent address and other addresses from, from church leaders really try to firmly lead us in this other direction, 
toward Zion, toward um, including and accepting uh, uh, other people's perspectives yeah. and opinions. Yeah. So I was going to comment. I um, are we allowed to just interrupt you? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Anytime. Sure. I, I'm kind of bad. At I'm that. sure the audience um, would welcome that. Yeah. I no. I just I think that's really become the problem is um, when you surround yourself by people who think the same way that you do and you create that echo chamber, then you see everything through that lens, right? And so um, specifically on city council, there's this whole realm of, of people who think that anything that has to do with government is corrupt at every level. And I got into city council and I'm meeting with the city manager and the mayor and all the department chairs and I'm learning and learning and meeting all of these wonderful people. And I'm like, where's the corruption? Like I, there's just, there's not corruption. You know, I, I just, anyway, so it's trying to combat that, that, that people see through this lens in every way. And so then when you start getting caught up in those conspiracy theories, <laughs> you start seeing everything through that. And so that's what happened with the pandemic and the mass and the vaccine and kids like right now we're fighting CRT and comprehensive sex education and everything is so evil and Satan's trying to take over and we everyone just needs to take a deep breath, <laughs> step back, talk to people, research, look at both sides. I mean, right. It's like, no, it, I feel like people have lost the ability to do that. Yeah. And so anyways, I just wanted to make that comment. So you, you both went through, it sounds like as a family and as a couple, you went through a period of discovery that opened you up to uh, the perspectives and situations, life experiences of other people. And you felt, so can you um, just maybe explain to me really briefly what, what those experiences were, maybe some of those uh, aha moments or, or personal spiritual experiences that opened your heart rather than close them to uh, people who either, either ward members in your case, uh, in both your case, and Jeremy, you served as Bishop. You were just, you served your term, your term just expired recently, right? In the last few months, but yeah. you've been Bishop of a congregation for several years. Um, now, uh, Julie is a city council person. What, what, what is it that's, that worked on your heart during this time? What was that? So, I think we both have several experiences, yeah. but I can think of one I'd like to share. And do you want to? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I'll share more generally. Just taking the time to hear people's stories that I normally would have disagreed with. And um, instead of having it, um, you know, told to me by some, you know, someone who agrees with me, hearing it from their perspective, it was just amazing. And, and you know, one particular is uh, the Faith Matters, you, 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 uh, your podcast has done a great job in bringing those different perspectives. Um, listen, learn, love. Hearing the stories of, of these individuals, I was just, I was so taken aback by how incredible these, these individuals were in the, in the LGBTQ uh, community that hearing their stories, they were just, they were, they were amazing, noble, um, loving people. And I was just, I think that more than anything um, made me rethink things and, and, and recognize that, that everyone can teach me, you know, regardless of where they're at, that there's something that we can learn from each other and see the, the, the humanity and, and really remember that we're all part of the family of God. We're brothers and sisters. And that's, that's the most important thing. And this came to the fore because uh, one of the things that Julie first had to deal with, and we talked about in the last podcast, is this LGBT non-discrimination ordinance that uh, you, that the mayor was uh, had been working on for some time before you joined the city council. And we, we discussed that uh, at length yesterday, so no need to revisit that. Um, we can just direct our listeners back to that. But what led you... Um, Julie, what's your what was your personal story of your, your personal change of heart? Maybe what what is it that energizes, inspires? Uh, I'm just gonna warn you, I'm gonna cry because this is oh, okay. <laughs> it's been quite the year. Um, I would say so. 
I am a just absolute 100% extroverted extrovert, right? Like I feed off of people. So the pandemic and being closed off from everyone was incredibly hard for me. And so it became a period of introspection and who am I and what's my worth? And, you know, so um, I, I would say like every day, like we were um, hiking a lot and being outside. And um, I started really making it a matter of, prayer and meditation and scripture study. I was reading Mosiah 4 every morning. Um, that was, that uh, during Come Follow Me, that chapter just really, we were doing the Book of Mormon and that chapter just really stuck out to me. And when the word nothingness comes up, I clicked on it and it leads to Mosiah 1, I mean, Mosiah, Moses 1. And I love that account of Moses figuring out that he's a son of God. Right. And, um, I started just reading those like every morning and one morning I was, I was also, okay, this is a big part of it. I also was rediscovering heavenly mother. I had come across because of podcasts, some books and some information. Um, I've studied woman in the priesthood and you know, that whole issue for several years. So then heavenly mother, just she's becoming more of um, an, a topic that we can talk about and everyone's not so afraid anymore to talk about her. Some people still are. Um, and I have a daughter that was very into it. And so doing lots of, of um, discovery and, and having some really special moments seeing Heavenly Mother all around me. So one morning I was laying in our backyard on the grass and it was beautiful weather. There was a slight breeze. I was looking up through the trees and I was kind of just doing a little bit of breathing, meditating. And um, the words came to me that I was born to make manifest the glory of God within me. And that became my mantra. And, and what it was, was not just my heavenly father, but my heavenly mother, my heavenly parents that created me are literally within me because they created me. And that I didn't have to go be this amazing so I felt inadequate, right? Like big time to, to be on city council. And this is before I got elected. So I was just assuming I was gonna get elected and felt very inadequate. And um, I, I was reassured over and over again that it wasn't gonna be me that was on city council. Like I didn't have to use my strength and my love and my kindness, but that I could use that of my heavenly parents. I could use their strength and their courage and their kindness and their love and their compassion and it was kind of a self-discovery of me and my worth and the love that my heavenly parents have for me no matter what, right? Like nothing that I do is going to increase that love. They just love me because they created me. And that I think helped me in so many ways. But when you know that about yourself, you know, listening to Tom Christofferson's last podcast on Faith Matters, he talks about that when you love yourself and you know God your heavenly parents love for you, you can love other people better. And I started seeing people differently after that. And every time I would start comparing myself or feeling bad about myself or starting to feel fear or, or being scared, those words, I was born to make manifest the glory of God within me just kept coming to me over and over and over again. Mm. And so that led to lots and lots of more experiences. But for me, that was such a I will never forget laying on my on the grass in my backyard and having that moment because it changed me. And I think it, look, none of this is coincidental, right? I mean, God is in the details of the details of the details of our lives. And he knew that if I was going to be able to do this and have this impact, that I needed to have strength within me and I needed to have people around me who also had opened up their hearts and their minds. And, you know, I, if I had had to vote yes on this NDO and my husband didn't agree with me, <laughs> that would have been really hard. But instead I had my best friend fighting for me and getting on Facebook and making posts and explaining why I needed to vote the way that I did and why it was the right thing to do. And so that was just, I just love the way that God works, that he puts the experiences that you need in your life so that you can do what he wants you to do. Mm. Wow. Yeah, that's a, that's quite an experience. It's in, interesting that you were lying, like cradled in the earth. In you the felt, earth. 
And, and a are... tree is a symbol of the Heavenly Mother. And I was looking up into <laughs> a tree. And I mean, it's all, when you start looking for Heavenly Mother, she is everywhere. <laughs> yeah. I love that. I remind, it kind of reminds me of when Joseph, Joseph's experience in the grove, he was seized upon by some power, but took him to the earth. And he's lying on the earth, I think. Yeah. and just cradled in the earth and then earth. he has then he has that experience of of that revelation and and i'm i'm also struck in joseph's experience by the love that he felt that seemed to stay with him he said for for some time weeks after that experience i wonder if that and the first word was joseph the first word that god spoke was joseph that's my favorite part like he knows mm. us he knows yeah. us all very intimately because he yeah. created us. <laughs> so that experience really informed and um, inspired your political life. This was, this was even before your, your public life had began. And yeah, I was in the middle of my campaign, of course. But, yeah. Oh, and that's, well, that's, I mean, I'm in, I'm. What a blessing to have an experience like that um, at, at that time when you probably needed it most. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And it, I mean, it, it has continued. It's been a year. And it, it was May of last year, and it has continued for an entire year. And I, um, I struggle. I I spend a lot of time on my knees. I, you know, I I want to just. I don't want to do anything that's going to hurt building the kingdom, right? And um, now that I'm like in this political realm, I'm recognizing really quickly how easy it could be to get sucked into the political Stuck. games, yeah. right? Right. And I, I just, I'm like, no, I'm going to just be a mom. I'm going to just be a nice person. I love everyone. And that's why when he came out, I came out <laughs> when he <laughs> this posted is on Facebook before the election. And he can talk about what led up to that. But I didn't publicly express my political views because I want to represent every single person in my district. I represent roughly 85,000 people who are Republicans, Democrats, independents, non-voters, right? Every, and I want to represent every single one of them. And so I didn't want to come out with a strong political stance. Sure. So, you know, because I, I really do feel strongly that I'm in a nonpartisan position. Everyone knows I'm a Republican, but I want to represent everyone. And I think my vote on the NDO showed that because it's not typical of what I should have voted if I was going to go with your typical far right conservative view or whatever. Yeah, the, you, you entered this as the, sort of the conservative Mormon mom. Yes. And uh, a lot of conservative Mormon moms, perhaps more, more dads maybe, might have, <laughs> might have uh, disagreed with the non-discrimination ordinance. Um, we talked about that again, again yesterday, yeah. but um, uh, so we, we won't, but I, I think uh, you, you've need the strength that you, were given in that very early experience has been tested. I know because I know a little bit about your experience, right. and you've, it's been very painful, um, mostly because of that position that you took in support of that NDO, which was consistent with what the church wanted. It was like, yeah, this, the institutional church was all in favor of that NDO, but a lot of church members were fearful and um, and not supportive. And we won't dive into that. But uh, Jeremy, your um, your your experience has also been uh, rather difficult. Why don't you why don't you explain what's happened with you in your in the last year and uh, and I, I'm sure this it, it was it was great to finally be released from that position as bishop because I, it had I, become I, I, lo I love I love my experience. I absolutely love my ward. They're just amazing people. Um, yeah. Couldn't be with the better people. <clears throat> I uh, so I've I've been last several years, very interested in, in conflict and, and kind of the concept of the hero's journey, which, you know, I listened to a lot of Jordan Peterson and, and in, in a, you know, in a shortly said the hero's journey is the voluntary confrontation of the frightening unknown. And, and maybe the metaphor I like to use is like the waters that carried the, the people of Jared across to the promised land. They were you know, they're like, to me, I think that's a good representation of conflict. They're, they can be very scary. They can be um, destructive, but yet they can be what also carries you to the promised land. If, uh, if your vessel is tight, you know, if you're dedicated and you have your eye single to the glory of God, those, the, 
there's there's a treasure in in that and so you know you also, I need, to be, you also need to be open to the unexpected because the thing the thing that you set out for Absolutely. can often yeah it's almost you need to have never. holes in both both ends of your ship <laughs> because you might be doing a 180 yeah and that's a absolutely true and uh so um i i think too too often we avoid conflict because it it usually it can end very badly it can be lead to contention and and so i'm just kind of fascinated with the concept you know if, if we can learn how to to address it and confront it in in a in the right way i think it's it's going to lead to the charity it's going to lead to christ-like love and and being able to see each other and and create space for each other and uh you know what what the what it requires to build zion you need to do that and so i kind of saw this opportunity um like maybe let's 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 try it out you know let's let's try and uh see if you know in some way i, I can't uh test test this out these principles and and um and i as, as i said earlier it you know I, I was concerned about kind of the narratives being spread how that was how that was being heard among people that didn't share that and 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 how that was being was being perceived as very ex exclusionary of of other you know people that aren't members of a church or members of the church don't share the you know some of the the political ideologies that maybe the mainstream um, members do. So be specific. What were you doing here? So I, I was very con so I, I had a conversation, um, and I I was just concerned how it was you know there it's a very public debate and and some of the rhetoric was just was just over the top. It was very you know very exclusionary around yeah. this non-discrimination ordinance no, no go different. back to the go back to the election go yeah, back yeah, in october okay, okay. Yeah. Yeah, okay. september right. october and and so i i was working for a guy and his his uh family is they were immigrants and uh, a group of immigrants that were were often maligned you know um mm -hmm. uh deprecated by our president and so i was having a conversation with him just about work and and we kind of got off in a little bit of politics and he he, I said something that that he kind of realized that I wasn't voting for for the Donald Trump, and he was confused. He's like, I thought I was told your prophet said you guys have to have to vote for for him, and I'm like, oh, wow. no, no, absolutely not. So that and, was his perception that and, if you were LDS, you had to vote for and Trump. So, and so, and then the comment after it was, he says, oh, that's so good because I was I was I was resenting you. I was having these feelings of resentment. We have a long history of a great relationship and he respects me. And he was saying, I just had this resentment. And, and I'm not saying he was, you know, in, in his perception of this, I was probably not, not necessarily fair either, but he was just, he just felt like, um, you know, how, how could someone he knew so well who had disparaged some people that were important to him, how, you know, how could he vote? And I'm not saying people that voted for Trump buy into that by any means, but just, that he had the perception that members of the church were were required to to follow a certain ideology, really, um, kind of was was the straw that that broke the camel's back, and and that's when I decided, you know, I I want to I want to present a perspective that I don't think is being um, heard as much as it should be in my circles. I mean, I'm sure, depending on where you live in the country, you know, that it might be the opposite, but you know, in in my little community. I didn't feel like that perspective was being shared and, and, and people were feeling alienated because okay. of that. And so I decided to, to, to make a post and explain the reasons why I, you know, I'm, I'm a conservative and it, but I'm not voting this way. And, and I tried to, to, to bring forth a substantive, you know, argument as to, or perspective why I'm not doing that. And just so people that, maybe feel the way I do, but don't feel comfortable voicing it because of where they live, um, kind of be an ally to them and just um, yeah. bring a voice to that. Okay, and what happened? People very happy. He, he posted six times in one week, but yeah, he did it very prayerfully and very calmly. He never ever got into a fight or an argument with anyone, well, but- Yeah, and each post was a different, I was, you know a different aspect of why um 
but yeah, I, I, I laid some ground rules before I, I did this. I, I didn't just, it wasn't me emoting. I, I, I wanted to, you know, I knew I could, it could very easily be something that turned very ugly. And so I said, so okay, I can't be offended. If I'm going to do this, I cannot choose to be offended by anyone. And, <laughs> I wasn't so good at that. <laughs> these are my ground rules. These are mine. So I, I decided, um, and then that I, if I ever started to feel resentment or unkind, feelings. unkind feelings toward, you know, people, then that was my, you know, stop, stop doing it. Cut it off. Um, yeah. And so, and I, and the other one was, I'm not going to do this perfectly. Don't, you don't, don't expect, you know, be ready to learn and to, and to, to be willing to change, you know, how I'm, how I'm doing it. So when you posted this, you, you knew that your flock was going to read it. It wasn't targeted at them. It was just a general post, but, sure. but of course you're, um, the people in the ward were going to read it, latch on to it. Um, what kind of acceptance and what kind of pushback did you get? Were you surprised or, you know, and did you, and, and did you think thoroughly about those implications? Because as, as a sure. bishop, you, yeah, the, the calling itself carries some gravitas or whatever you want to call it, you know, so it, you have to be, I'm sure, careful, um, particularly careful about how you express things on social media because of knowing how it might be taken by, Absolutely. but you felt, but you felt like as a private citizen, you really did, you needed to separate those two things and be able to express your views as a private citizen uh apart from your uh, role as bishop yeah yeah and that's kind of the you know joe smith said in by the proving of contraries the truth is manifest and so i kind of had you know i i totally honor and think the the church's policy on political neutrality is is divinely inspired i love it uh we're also encouraged to be um, involved in our community as private citizens yeah and I did know that there was going to be fallout. Um, I didn't know, you know, who was going to come from or, or to what degree, but I knew I, I, I was very, I was very observant about, you know, the, the political environment and knew it, just how divisive this was. And I thought, okay, I have to be willing also when, when things, um, maybe relationships feel strained to be willing to, to repair those and, and to show an increase of love. Um, but, um, that's hard to do. That's hard to do on social media because you posted this on social media, right? It is. Well, it is. I, I'm thinking more that the, the people close to me that that I knew um, would uh, would would not like it. Yeah. And, okay. And so, so that the, like even maybe his bishopric counselors or you know our young women's president or people like people that we work with, right? Yeah. Serve with that we so, love. So, Julie, I, I know when a spouse takes. Uh, uh, criticism or takes fire um, you feel it more than the maybe even more than the spouse does oh like, that's how that's how it is so how was this experience how was this received and what what happened can you um so first of all I have a husband who does not like Facebook and never was on Facebook so I've been a Facebook person for like 13 years and he was oh. never on it and when people started attacking me in the campaign he joined Facebook and he made some really sweet posts about why I was running and why I would be awesome at city council and it was incredible and very well re received uh then he was off Facebook right then he jumps back on for this and he doesn't make one post he makes six posts and um, also, I think I had to recognize that, um, so Jeremy is like an incredibly likable person. He owned a company for 23 years where every employee would just have glowing things to say about him. He's a very wonderful, caring, compassionate, calm, like Christ-like person and everyone loves Jeremy. And so to all of a sudden have people <laughs> so mad at him and saying really horrible things about him was incredibly painful, like incredibly painful, but he was fine. <laughs> he, I, I got offended. I got hurt. I cried um, over things that people who we love said about him and towards him. Um, he was fine. He did not see people differently. He would reach out, he would text someone and say, hey, can we talk? Or 
hey, I just want you to know I love you. Um, one funny thing that happened was the Sunday after all of this, so it got brought up in ward council, even though he didn't want to bring it up. He didn't ever post as a bishop, right? Like he never mentioned that he was a bishop. But in the comments on the post, someone would say, I can't believe you're saying this as a bishop, or you have no right to say this as a bishop, which isn't true. If you look at the church handbook, it's- As a bishop, you don't. <laughs> as a bishop, you can't, but you can say things. as ser While serving as a bishop, you're more than welcome to get involved in things politically. In fact, even as a stake president, all the way up to an area authority, you can be involved in political things. Um, as long as you don't use your position, right? To, to further those political beliefs or whatever. So, um, and he had checked with our stake president to make sure that he wasn't doing anything you shouldn't be doing and to just kind of let him know what he was doing. And But someone else brought it up in ward council. Um, there was just a lot of like, I don't know, tension. lots of tension. So we're sitting at church and he gets up. So there's speakers, right? And then he, the person conducting his counselor said, Bishop would like to share a few words. And I was like, ah, no, <laughs> dying. I, I'm like, don't say anything. Like there's people in our ward that maybe don't know. Although I think everyone knew, but I mean, I wouldn't say that a hundred percent of our ward we're voting for Trump, yeah. but maybe 90, right? Like a lot, a lot. Of wow. People. So it's very conservative, very conservative. Very. Board. Our yeah. whole area, like basically my district that I represent is very pro-Trump. And yeah. during the election, there were signs and flags everywhere, right? I mean, everywhere. So we very much felt <laughs> like, I don't know if I saw a Biden sign in my whole square mile. I mean, you know, because I think also people, even if their closet, they were closet, and maybe they didn't even want to vote for Biden, they just didn't want to vote for Trump, and but they didn't feel comfortable saying anything. So we did have, sorry, I keep interrupting myself. We did have several people reach out to us and message him specifically, thanking him privately <laughs> that, you know, oh, I'm the only one in my family that feels this way, but it's nice to know that someone else does, or, you know, it's different comments like that that were interesting. But so he stands up in church and very emotionally apologizes for anything he might have done or said that hurt people. And he expressed his deep love for every member of our ward. Um, I wish I could remember everything he said because it was so beautiful. And I think, you know, we had just gone back to church. So probably half of our ward was still on Zoom. There were several families who chose not to come because they were so mad at him. Um, I don't know if they were watching. I don't know. But so it was about half of our ward that was there, but it was beautiful. Like, and he didn't mention anything political. He didn't mention, you know, Republicans, Democrats, Trump, Biden, nothing. He just expressed that his incredible love that he had. And he had, he had um, over several months had maybe um, in a testimony or a talk mentioned some of his feelings about the Nephites and Lamanites and the seeing people as your enemy and um, stuff like that, that maybe some people would have picked up on of what he was really trying to say, but more just how we should treat people and view people who are different than us. But this was, it was pretty incredible to watch that happen. And now, um, eight, eight months later, well, then we had the whole NDO thing. So he got on Facebook again <laughs> and posted about that, which made more people mad or at least the same people mad. Um, he, lots of people, several people asked for him to be released as a bishop. I mean, it wasn't like we could just disagree. It was like, anyway, I, but we did have some people reach out to us and say, can we talk about this? Can you explain why you would vote for this? And I appreciated that. Very few people did that, but some people did because I think in the church, we view Zion and unity as everyone has to agree. I think a lot of people, I think that's the way I was raised. I think that when everyone agrees with each other, there's just more happy feelings. And then that's what Zion looks like. And then we're all going to get taken to heaven. Wrong, right? Like we have, 
we're, we're all different. We were all made different. We all have different views and different op of opinions. It's finding that disagreement and learning from each other and being okay if we don't all feel the exact same way and then still having the unity, right? So yeah. last week we went on trek and Jeremy and I were mon pa and I was terrified because I, I knew, sorry, I knew we were gonna be with a lot of people for three days in close proximity. It was our stake and the stake to the east of us who were mad at me, who had said things on Facebook, who had said things to other people, who had signed the petitions. And you know what? It was great. We worked shoulder to shoulder and everyone was kind and loving. And I don't know what their personal <laughs> thoughts were inside their head about me, but everyone was, it was great. I didn't have hard feelings towards people. I try to let that go. I don't, you know, they didn't show that they had hard, hard feelings towards me. And it was just a beautiful experience. I think time helps. <laughs> time can heal some of those feelings. Um, there are still a couple of people who won't speak to him, which makes me so sad. Um, but I think we have to learn that gathering Israel is not gathering everyone who looks like us and thinks like us and acts like us. That's not, I mean, we have heard from our prophet over and over and over again that we need to gather Israel. And that's going to be every single one of God's children, even if they have different political views, even if they look different than us, even if they have behavior that is appalling to us or that's offensive to us. <laughs> Those are still God's children. And we have to love, 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 love with open arms and welcome arms and bring everyone in. Love does seem to be that sort of irresistible force over time. So time, over time, love can break down about anything. And I think that's maybe that's the beginning of that healing happened partly through this Trek experience that you had. But yeah. it, it seems it seems that just responding with love um, has been the key here, right? As Jeremy, that comes naturally to you, I suppose. Um, well, she, she, she's, um, she likes to exaggerate a lot. If anyone knows Julie, she's, and, and she's, you know, very charitable in how she describes me. Don't, you know, don't expect me to live up to that. But uh, I, I would like to, I, I think, um, as far as loving, I think, you know, it, a lot of people have different definitions of what that, what that, um, entails i think in this in this topic that we're talking about i think creating space for people to be authentic um i think within us you know we, we learn the scriptures that god ordained us to be agents to act for ourselves yeah. and not to be acted upon and if we create if we don't create environments where people can be authentic and go through that process then they're going to rebel against that because it's 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 deep within us to want to be self-determining and, yeah. and to come and, and make that journey and make, you know, come to, come to know Christ in, in, in a way that is, is best for us. And if we, even, even unintentionally, I think we do it a lot of times subconsciously, we just, you know, we, we exclude people. We don't, you know, the whisper, or we don't reach out to people they think differently. That's very painful. And it, and it, creates doesn't create that space where people can 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 manifest that drive to become agents to act for themselves and we miss out on a lot because they have gifts that we need but we don't we're not ready to receive them i think really you mentioned that about uh, you learned that about our lgbt um, brothers and sisters if right. we haven't been ready to receive the gifts that they can offer us um, and maybe that's maybe it's time you have some thoughts about that <laughs> it's time <laughs> well no i i mean i i think you could take any group of people right as soon as you um sit with them and listen to them and get to know them and hear their story you think differently about them i we have um have the privilege of being around a lot of hispanic people he employed a lot of hispanics for a long time and they're beautiful people and they have stories and they have painful stories and they're hard workers. And it, um, 
you can't dehumanize any group of people, right? So it's easy to, in politics especially, to group everyone into this community that doesn't have a face anymore. Each, each one of those people don't have a face. They're the immigrants or they're the LGBTQ population. But when you um, see them as individual people and as God's children, it changes you. And so it's, it's hard, it makes it harder <laughs> because then you start, you start seeing all of the pain and, and all of the problems and how do you, how do you fix all these huge problems and how do you bring every single person in? One of the most incredible things through this um, NGO specific experience, we've had a number of our kids' friends um, or other teenagers, young adults, that have felt alienated from the church, who now see in us, um, people who are still active in the church with strong testimonies that, that um, we're all in to, to the gospel of Jesus Christ. We're not struggling with our testimonies. We just see where there's some great areas that need to be changed and need to be improved. And we wanna be a part of helping that to happen, right? And so then these, um, these, sweet teenagers, young adults that are just lost right now because they don't feel love from the LDS community or from their families and they are struggling with decisions and their lifestyles. And for them to know that they're, that we're a safe place and that we'll love them no matter what, it's just been incredible to experience that over and over again. And that's way more important to me than the approval of my voters, my constituents, my, um, some of my friends. I'm much more worried about those that feel alienated than the ones who are already part of the group that fits in. So that's, that's been something that's been neat for me to recognize. That's a pretty good way to summarize this conversation, I think. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, thank you uh, so much for, for joining us. It's an emotion, it's been an emotional time. I'm mindful that you had something like 800 critical emails uh, that came your way, some of them pretty vicious. That's and not counting texts, Facebook messages. Those posts. are just emails. <laughs> oh my gosh. And how you, and that, that experience that you had pointing you in this direction of public service um, must have been severely tested through all, just having to immerse yourself in that. And, and uh, boy, what a, what a difficult, but it's been uh, very courageous. I, I made the comment to him. I'm like, I just feel like a piece of clay and God's trying to mold me and it hurts. And it hurts. he's like, no, you're not clay. You're the, you're the little, what is it? Cherry tree. Oh, what is you're it? The, current the, current the current bush. bush. I'm the current yeah. bush. The current bush. Yeah. You just being pruned. <laughs> I, I'm an arborist. So I like, I like that analogy. <laughs> like I am getting cut and I'm bleeding. But, I mean, God's, God's trying to turn me into something I can, couldn't be on my own. Yeah. And and to use me in the process to help his children and that's incredibly humbling. So we'll I keep going. It's it's really it. inspiring and just so I'm privileged to uh, to know you and really privileged to have you on this for this for this hour. It's a that's kind of been a sweet and painful story to tell, <laughs> <laughs> and we have a lot of work to do. We um, do. So thank you so much. Thank and you. Uh, we'll, thank you. We'll talk later. We'll talk soon. Thanks. All right. All right. Bye. Bye. thanks so much for listening and a big thanks to the spillsburys for coming on to talk with bill and as always if the faith matters content is resonating with you and you get the chance we'd love for you to leave us a review on apple podcasts or whatever platform you listen on it definitely helps us to get the word out about faith matters and we really appreciate the support thanks again for listening and as always you can check out more at faithmatters.org